Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time at First Baptist Church of Central City. We would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. I mean, that video was another example of International Mission Board missionaries out in the field reaching people for Christ. And this year with our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, our goal is $5,000. I encourage you to pray about what you might give. And you can rest assured that every single penny given to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes directly to missionaries on the field. It goes directly to the work being done. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you have your Bibles, open them to Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Luke 15, 1 through 10. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay too. We're going to have those passages on the screen for you. Uh, but Luke 15, 1 through 10. And you know, Jesus said, They will know you by your love for one another. This morning we are celebrating the advent or the coming of love in Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian today, and if you're following Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in your heart. And that means that you have access within you, through the Holy Spirit, to a great love. You have been greatly loved by God, and you are able to greatly love others by the grace of God. And perhaps the greatest witness that Christians have to who Jesus is, is their love. But you know, we say that, and yet we see throughout our world that even in the Christmas season, so much of the church fails in their witness. Because too often the church can be so very unloving. So this morning, if we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts, and if we therefore have access to the same kind of love that God has had for us, then what does that love look like? What kind of love? does God have for us and what kind of love do we have access to through the Holy Spirit in our hearts that's the question we're asking as we look now to Luke chapter 15 verses 1 through 10 it begins verse 1 now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him this Jesus verse 2 both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble saying this man receives sinners and eats with them so he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost." I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for everything that you've given us. And we do thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. And we pray, Father, today. As your people, you would make us aware of the capacity for love that you've given us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to unleash that love on the world. God, I pray that you be with us today and help us to hear from you. Lord, I pray that you would speak directly, individually to our hearts today. 
God, help us to draw near to you and help us to know your presence. Lord, give us a desire to serve you and to serve your people. And we pray today that we would be changed. Lord, we thank you for your love. Make us more like Jesus. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You know, about 31 years ago, this month, my parents got an Alaskan Malamute named Peeper. Peeper. Beautiful dog. Beautiful dog. The dealership the dad owned, they had worked together and they'd got him this dog for Christmas. And so it was a Christmas present. He was two months old when they got him in December. My parents loved this dog. I mean, really just adored this dog. Uh, but he was four months old in February of 1988, which was the month and year that I made my debut on the planet. And you know, I didn't have anything against this dog. I had no interest and having a grudge match with an Alaskan Malamute, no interest whatsoever. I had much more important things I was doing. I was busy filling up diapers, spitting up on people, napping and getting my picture taken. I mean, that's what I was doing, but this dog, see, he didn't like all that because a jealousy began brewing in his little canine heart. And so you started to see that he would sneer a little bit when I was brought near. He let out a growl or two. He started getting really destructive around the house when all this attention was being shown to me. The attention had gone from him to this new human child. And he didn't like it at all. And so ultimately, sadly for Peeper, come July 1988, Peeper had to go away. And I remained master <laughs> of my domain. Verse 1 tells us this. It says, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Spiritually speaking, these people aren't good for anything but filling up diapers and spitting up on people. Okay, these people are dirty. They're unclean. They're sinful. They're filthy. And that filth can get on you. And they're the type of people that only their mothers could love. And yet they're coming to Jesus and drawing near to Jesus and he is receiving them. And the Pharisees and the scribes who were the religious leaders of that day, they get jealous. Verse 2, both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, it doesn't specifically say that they get jealous, so we've got to see how we figure that. First of all, in other places in the Bible, we see that they have an envious spirit. We see that they're jealous of Jesus. But we also have to understand the context of what's happening here. Jesus has come, and he is claiming to be the Messiah. He's claiming to be God's anointed one through whom God is going to fulfill all his promises. It's through the Messiah that God is going to bring about his kingdom at last. He's going to save Israel from their oppressors. He's going to save the world from their sins. And so this is some pretty big stuff. And everyone's coming. They're flocking to Jesus. And they're excited about Jesus. Except the religious leaders. Because he isn't really associating with them. He's not associating with the people who consider themselves to be the righteous people. He's not associating with the elite Jewish class. But instead, Jesus is associating with, he's loving, he's spending time with, he's speaking to, going to, eating with, and caring for sinners and tax collectors. Now you may say, why in the world would you throw tax collectors into the mix above all the other professions? Well, understand, at this time, Rome basically ruled the whole world. They ruled the whole world. And so when they would go into an area and they would take it over, they would recruit people from that group and they would make them tax collectors. And so there were Jewish people who were tax collectors and they were seen as traitors in their home country. Absolute traitors. They made a lot of money doing Rome's bidding. And so people hated them. But ultimately the Pharisees and the scribes feel like this. They feel like this is their party they were the ones who were religious before everybody thought it was cool to be religious they, this is their party and now people who were not invited by them have shown up late 
And the supposed host is giving them all the special treatment. They don't like it. They're growling. They're sneering. And they're becoming destructive. Now we might fast forward about 2,000 years and ask the question, what might that attitude look like in the church today? And basically in churches today, what we might see this as is this is us not liking people who come in because they don't dress the way we think they ought to dress. Or us not liking people who are coming in because they don't act the way that we think they ought to act. They don't behave. The way we think they should behave. Or this is us not liking people who are starting to come in and suddenly they find a seat they like. And it's your seat. Or they have a worship style that they like that you don't. Or they have different questions that you figured out a long time ago that they are still wondering about. And that happens and we say, we don't want these people here. They're messing up our church. We were here First, we were here first. That would be the kind of attitude the Pharisees had. And folks, understand, Jesus was at his church first. And if you attend a church somewhere that has that mentality that everyone thinks this is my church and I was here first, guess who is not at that church? Jesus. Jesus, right? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Now we love that. We are good Southern Baptist Great Commission people. Right? We love seeking and saving the lost. We love the idea of evangelism. We love the idea of souls being one to Jesus. Until those souls show up and inconvenient stuff for us. Just a little bit. But folks, if you want to talk about an inconvenience, when Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost, that meant to the point of dying for their sins. And what we have to understand is it's not their sins he died for. He died for our sins. All of us were born separated from God. Jesus died for us. And if it were not for the fact that Jesus died for your sins, then understand you would be in hell when you died. We have to grasp, we need to understand that the church and this church specifically exist for the purpose of fulfilling the great commission of making disciples of all the nations. And that's how we weigh out everything that we do. It's how we weigh out our attitudes. It's how we weigh out our motives. It's how we weigh out our techniques. It's how we weigh out our feelings. And the way these religious leaders were feeling is they were jealous. They were upset. So Jesus tells three parables now we looked at the third one earlier this year so we're going to be looking at the first two this morning he tells three parables first two he begins verse four in verse four he begins what man among you if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep, which was lost. And then the second parable goes like this. Verse 8. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. Now, what is Jesus' point with these parables? Verse 7. Verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. 
And in verse 10, he says this, In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now you write this down. Jesus says, when a sinner turns to Jesus, there is a celebration in heaven. When a sinner turns to Jesus, there is a celebration in heaven. Now, how many of you have ever celebrated the fact that you lost money? No. No, we don't celebrate that, right? We celebrate things that are exciting. We celebrate things that are good. Show of hands this time. How many of you have taken the initiative before to throw a party for your worst enemy? Show of hands. Nobody. Absolutely not. Who do we throw parties for? People we love. People we care about. You want to know why heaven celebrates when a sinner turns to Jesus? The reason is that God loves sinners. God loves sinners. Now for some of you, this might be news. It might be the first time you heard something like this. Understand around here, we call it good news. But seriously, you may be sitting there, this may be new, and you may be wondering now, wait a minute, that's not what I heard. That's not what I heard. Doesn't God punish sinners? Doesn't God send people to hell? And I mean, let's get real. Doesn't God hate sinful people? Maybe that's your question this morning. And my friend, if those are your questions, I want to assure you, if you're struggling with that, You don't know what the Lord is like. And we want to tell you what he's like today. You see, God made every good thing that you see, all things that are beautiful, all things that are wonderful, all the people that you care so deeply about, God made them. And the Bible says that God made human beings like you and I in his image. Essentially, he made us to be his managers over creation. He made us to bear his image into the world. And he made us to have a personal relationship with him for all eternity. Not to ever get sick, not to ever get old, not to ever die. And yet, we human beings turn away from him. We turn from him. And when you turn from the only source of life and creation, and you turn away from him, you're going the opposite direction, which is death and hell and the grave. God made us out of his love for us, and he wanted to share this with us, share what the goodness of life could be with us, and yet we threw it in his face. And I don't know about you, but if I handed you a $100 bill and you tore it up and threw it up in the air... I wouldn't feel very sorry for you if you needed another $100. God had no obligation to do anything from that point. And yet he embarked on a great plan for our rescue and salvation to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, his son. Understand, if you're worrying whether or not God sends people to hell, God doesn't send anybody to hell. The reality is, we are all going. That's where you and I are headed. Without being saved, without being rescued by God, you are on your way to hell. And you shouldn't take offense at that or think that the spotlight's been put on you because the same is true for me, the same is true for anyone in this room, anyone on this planet. We are separated from God and we are all in the same boat. And yet, God, out of his great love for us, he came down to us on the first Christmas morning. In the person of Jesus Christ, he took on human flesh. And Jesus would go on to suffer and to die in our place to pay the price for our sins. Jesus paid your sin debt in full paid in full and now even though we are all drowning in this ocean of sin and even though none of us could possibly swim to the shore god has thrown out a lifeline 
He has given us His Son, Jesus Christ, out of His desire that we would turn from our sins and believe on Him for salvation. And the Bible says there is rejoicing in heaven for just one sinner, just one, who repents and believes. There is a celebration and rejoicing in heaven for just one sinner who turns from their sins and trusts in Christ for salvation. You need to understand today that God loves you. He cares about you. He desires for you to have eternal life. Despite your sin, despite your mistakes, despite your baggage, Despite turning from him, despite your doubts, God loves you. And his will is that you would be saved. You know, in Advent we celebrate the first coming of Jesus Christ. And we also anticipate his second coming. And many have mocked that. Many have wondered, why is he so slow about that? And you know, maybe he's not even real. Maybe that's why he's not coming back. So we expect that Jesus is just going to come for his people and he's going to judge the world and he's going to save those who've trusted him. Surely that's all foolishness. And you know, the Apostle Peter knew that people would come and they would mock and they would say those types of things in the last days. And he says this in his second letter. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In other words, you want to know why Jesus hadn't come back? Why he delays his tarry? It's because God knows. When Jesus comes again, that's it. No more second chances. No more opportunities for salvation. It's judgment day. It's judgment day. And the Lord has patiently waited because His desire is that every single person would turn to Him and be saved. God loves you. He loves you. But He's not going to take away your free will and force you Come to Him. He loves you. So seeing how God loves His people, how should Christian people view lost people? I mean, how should we look at those who have never received Jesus? And of course, first we should look at them with humility, recognizing that there's not any of us who were born righteous. Okay? All of us are sinners. And we've been saved by God's grace, if we've turned from sins and put our faith in Jesus. It's nothing that we earned. It's by His grace. But how should we look at people who don't know this yet, and we should look at them with love, with compassion, and with a desire to see them saved. A desire so strong that when people come to know the Lord, we celebrate along with the host of of heaven. And when that's the kind of love that we have, when we love people with the kind of love that only God has, the kind of love for lost people that is only possible when the Holy Spirit of God is dwelling in us and controlling our hearts, then what does that really look like? Okay, how does that play out in our world? How does that play out in our lives? How do we live this love? And the first way we live this love is simply this. We invite people. We invite. You know, the very first sermons in the history of Christianity, Jesus' first sermon, Philip, one of his early followers' first sermons, were simply this, come and see. Come and see. Somebody very skeptically came up, and they said, you mean to tell me you found the Savior of the world? Philip said, just come and see. Come and see. Inviting people into our midst is one of the easiest ways for us to make sure that people are regularly hearing the gospel. 
Because when they come, they will hear the message of Jesus preached with Jesus and his people present. Inviting people to church, to prayer meeting, to events we have, to revival services, to Christmas at the convention center. Inviting people is something that every single one of us can do. And a personal invitation to church is statistically the most effective way of seeing someone come into your church. Where they will regularly hear God's word and be a part of worship. So what should we do? And I would encourage you to do this. Make it your goal to invite one person every week. Make it your goal to invite just one person every week. The second way that we live this love is we tell. We tell. And if you love someone, you tell them what they need to know. You know how I know Hannah loves me? We eat lunch. We're sitting there afterward. She'll go, hey. No, something. Right? Because, and that's how you know your best friends from just your regular friends too. You know, because people don't want to have that conflict, so to speak, with you, and that'll just let you embarrass yourself all day, right? But if you love someone, you tell them something they need to know. If my house were on fire, and you drove by, and I'm in there, and you love me, you're not going to say, "Woo, get out the weenies and the marshmallows. Right? You're going to call, you're going to say, hey, buddy, your house is on fire. Understand, we are called, we are commissioned, we are commanded by God to tell people the great news about Jesus. And there's two ways we can tell them. We can tell them the gospel and tell them your testimony. And the gospel is simply the story that though we have turned from God, God loves us and Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead. He lives today and reigns today and He is ready to save us. All who would turn from their sins and believe in Him. But your testimony is more personal. Your testimony is what everyone can share that Jesus has done for you. What Jesus has done in your life. What Jesus has done for your family. Your encounter with Jesus. You can tell your testimony. The third way that we live this love is very simply we care. We care. Understand, Jesus was compassionate toward others. And we are called to show compassion. He healed the sick. He restored sight to the blind. He loved the unlovable. And he didn't sit back and say, well, if they want to come find me, they know where to find me. He went to them. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they hated him for it. They hated him. We are Jesus' hands and feet today. The Bible literally says we are the body of Christ in the world today. So we need to do acts of kindness for others. Just do acts of kindness. Do works of ministry. And you know, when we care for others, this is why we do something like Christmas at the convention center. Right? I know I said this before last year, and I'll say it again this year. It's not easy to put together. It's not something you necessarily want to do, I have no personal reason myself for us to want to leave the safety of this sanctuary, knowing everything's set up in our soundboard, knowing that everything is set up here, and go there and have a worship service. So why do it? Understand, we average Sunday mornings, just in the sanctuary, not counting our nursery, not counting those who are downstairs, we average 250 in worship, 250. Last year we went over for Christmas at the convention center and we'd seen a trend in the past few years leading up to that uh, of a decline in attendance at Christmas. You know, used to they said, everybody shows up, you got those C and E Christians, right? Everybody shows up Christmas and Easter. That's not really true anymore. Okay, people show up Easter now, they don't show up Christmas. They want to stay home, they want to open presents, they want to have food, they want to spend time with family. So Christmas is going downhill as far as attendance. We averaged 250, and we saw 325 there. We talked about it. We decided to follow up. We went at Easter. Uh, We were concerned because it was spring break, and every other church that day had lower attendance. 
I usually have a higher attendance. People were gone. We had about 60 of you all of our regulars who were gone, and that's fine. It was spring break. You were out of town. We had 410. 410. We go because it works. We go because we care about other people who don't know Jesus. I can tell you personally, I had two conversations this past week with two different people who don't attend church and aren't interested in coming to church. And both of them, as I talked to them about what we had going on, invited them, they said, you know, I may end up coming to that convention center service you're doing. I might come to that. It just makes folks comfortable. right? It's a different setting. It's kind of a neutral ground. It's an opportunity for us to love lost people people it gets us out into the community with the good news the message of jesus fourth way that we live this love is we give we give and we saw our lottie moon christmas offering but this isn't just about tithes and offerings jesus gave his whole life for sinners that we might be saved and we're asking how do we release That love that comes from His Holy Spirit dwelling in us so that we, like the Master, are giving our lives for others. We give of our time. We give of our talents. And we give of our money. Time, talents, money. It takes time to reach people. It takes time. I've been just as guilty as many of you When you have a neighbor, you think, man, I really wish they'd come to church with us. Love to see them. Love to see them come to know the Lord. But I can spend six hours on the couch never talking to that neighbor. Then as you're heading out the door, you think, man, well, I wish they'd come. It takes time. We have to designate time like we would anything else to love people and to invite them in and tell them about Jesus. Now, talents is a short and kind of easy way of putting it, but understand God has given you very specific gifts. He's given you a very specific role for reaching lost people and building up His kingdom, building up His church. And the purpose of every gift that you have, the purpose of every talent that you have, It's not so that your boss can brag on you and you can get a raise. It's not so that you can have this wonderful life. It's not so that you can go out into town and everybody say, man, what a cool cat that guy is. he got all kinds of charisma. It's so that God's kingdom would be built up. You have a much greater purpose than just drifting through life and swimming downstream along with everyone else. God has given you gifts and he wants you to use them for his glory. And we don't withhold our financial resources from God either. We give so that the ministry of God's church can be supported and out of obedience to his command. Because who gave you all the money that you have? God. God. Now some of you may have recoiled when I said that. Say, preacher, I didn't take a dime from anybody. Everything I've had, I worked hard for. I went out and I got it. I put in the time. I sacrificed time with my family. I earned a living for myself. Understand that might work when you're considering how you view the economy. When you're thinking about your bank account, when you're thinking about how you give to charity, when you're thinking about your politics, it might work. But who do you think put the breath in your lungs that you're alive? Who do you think gave you that IQ that you might have the intelligence to be able to work? Who gave you the physical health and strength that you needed to go in and put in your work every single day? Or who caused you to be born in this location as opposed to some third world country? Who caused you to be born in this time as opposed to the time of the settlers? Who caused you to be alive and to come into your family where you would have the opportunities that you had? God has given us everything. He gave his life for us. And we are to pour ourselves out for him. And finally, the fifth way that we live this love is very simple. We put God first. 
and we put others second. God first, others second. Jesus said the greatest commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it that you love your neighbor as yourself. Now where does that put us? Last. Last. We put ourselves last. Folks, God has given of himself selflessly. And yet we can be so selfish with our lives and with our time. Understand, we were born into sin by default. We are selfish people. That's who we are. And even the good things that we do, very often we do them for recognition. Or we just do them because they make us feel good. It's an ego trip for us. So how can we have this kind of love that Jesus had? How can we have this selfless, complete self-giving love? How do we have God's love for lost people? And it can only come from Jesus in us. Without having the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts, understand, folks, we can only become, we can only work to become more like the Pharisees. Religious hipsters. Right? We want to be the most religious of anyone we know, but we don't like it when others come around and cramp our style. We don't like it when others come on board. The only way to live like Jesus is to have His Holy Spirit in our hearts. And the only way to have the Holy Spirit in our hearts is to recognize that we are sinners and to repent to turn from sin and to be saved by the grace of Jesus. I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward. Here in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing, I am thine, O Lord. And maybe today you've never received the free gift of salvation that is offered in Jesus Christ. And you recognize today, for the first moment in your life, your need of Him. You recognize your sinfulness and your desire to be saved by His free grace. You see His love for you. I would encourage you to come. Maybe today you have been saved and you just realize that too much you've been growing inwardly. Kind of a little bit like a Pharisee. You like things your way, we all do. Struggling with that? You'd rather just keep other people at bay. But God wants you to give of yourself for others as He has given for us. Would you turn from self today and turn to Christ as we stand and sing?